Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, The Existence of God, Part 12. And for more information and resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. To set the context, we've been talking about the Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God. And that argument, you remember, goes, uh, whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And we've been looking at evidence for that controversial second premise that the universe began to exist. We looked at philosophical arguments, and then we looked at scientific confirmation of this premise. And we've uh, just most recently been looking at the confirmation of this premise from the second law of thermodynamics. And you remember we saw that the application of the second law of thermodynamics to the universe as a whole implies that given sufficient time, uh, given a finite amount of time, the universe will reach a state at which it becomes cold, dark, dilute, and dead. And the question arises, if given a finite amount of time, the universe will arrive at such a state, then why is it not now in such a state if it has already existed for infinite time? If the past is infinite, then the universe should have already reached a condition of uh, being lifeless, dark, dead, uh, and uh, dilute. And yet it's not. And all of this seems to raise the implication that the assumption behind the uh, problem is wrong. Namely, this assumes that the universe has existed forever. If the universe began to exist, then it has been simply a finite amount of time since the initial energy was put in at the beginning of the universe, and it is now winding down towards some sort of thermodynamic heat death, which it will arrive at in the future. And so the application of the second law to the universe as a whole implies that the universe and to exist, which is the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, of course, attempts have been made to try to avoid the beginning of the universe, which is implied by the second law. But so far, none of these has been successful in avoiding the beginning of the universe at some time in the finite past. For example, during the 1960s, a number of scientists said that perhaps the universe is in an eternal process of oscillating. That is to say, it expands and then it recontracts, and then it expands and then recontracts, and then expands and recontracts in a sort of concertina-like fashion, and that this process of oscillating has been going on from eternity past. So that if you were to trace the history of the universe back in time, it would look like a series of humps, which represent the cycles of expansion and contraction going back in time. The vertical axis is space, and then the horizontal axis here is time. And in this way, the beginning of the universe would be avoided. Ironically, however, the thermodynamic properties of the universe implies the very beginning of the universe that these um, theorists thought to avoid. For it's been shown that entropy or thermodynamic disorder is conserved from cycle to cycle. That is to say, the energy is not completely recycled each time it contracts and expands again. Rather, any thermodynamic disorder that accumulated in one cycle is pulled through to the second, where it accumulates even further, and then uh, pulled through to the one following that. So that over time, the thermodynamic disorder will continue to accumulate from cycle to cycle. Now, this has a very interesting effect upon the uh, behavior of an oscillating model. This entropy accumulation causes each cycle to be larger than the cycle before it and to have a longer duration. So that as you trace the expansions back in time, they would get smaller and smaller 
and smaller until one comes to a first oscillation and an absolute beginning of the universe. So that ironically, the thermodynamic properties of the oscillating model implied the very beginning that its proponents sought to avoid. In fact, since entropy is accumulating from cycle to cycle, if the past were infinite, you would have an infinite amount of entropy uh, in, in the universe. But astronomers have estimated on the basis of current uh, entropy levels in the universe that even if the universe were oscillating, it could not have gone through uh, more than 100 previous oscillations before you reach the first oscillation in the absolute beginning of the universe. Any questions or comments that you would have about oscillating models and the attempt to avoid the beginning? Yes, there's a question over here, and we're going to get a microphone to you so we can all hear your question. Well, the last few Scientific Americans have had some kind of variant on this where they've talked about some kind of convergence, or a, uh, which again is, is problematic from our point of view, and then also a, talked about a, a big bounce where uh, you accumulate density uh, and it, then it repulses much like if you put poles of, 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 of the same poles of, of, of two magnets together. Um, but it's, it seems to me variance on, on oscillation. It sounds like it. I have not read those specific articles. But one of the other problems with the oscillating models that I didn't even mention is that heretofore there hasn't been any known physics that would cause a recontracting universe to bounce back to a new expansion. The physics seem to predict that it would just collapse into a black hole from which it would never reemerge. Uh, and so physicists are looking for some sort of mechanism that would cause this sort of oscillatory behavior. But what this argument shows is that even if this were possible for the universe to be oscillating, the thermodynamic properties imply that it still has to have a beginning to the process. Yes, Cindy. Wait, let's get the mic here so we can all hear your comment. Being that I never took physics, uh, <laughs> when you mentioned that the... Um, energy is not always reserved going from one cycle to another, correct? What I said was that the energy isn't completely, completely recycled in the sense that you begin with a new low entropy level. It's not as though, say, entropy builds up to a certain quantity here, and then in the next cycle you start again with zero entropy all over again. What I'm saying is that whatever accumulates in the first cycle gets passed through to the second. And this is called the conservation of entropy from cycle to cycle. And why would that cause it to, to be? It, the effect of this increased entropy is that each cycle will be longer than the previous one, and the radius will be greater of the, of the expansion. And so that causes this uh, behavior of diminishing cycles as you go back in time. I'll take your word for it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, Dennis? Uh, wouldn't this make it, uh, for an atheist, less probable that if there have been many previous cycles, that the universe could, ar could arise again each time from purely natural processes? I mean, if it's like created and destroyed, how is it? We already say it's improbable that the universe could have risen from mm -hmm. natural processes, you know, that God had to have created yeah. the universe. Doesn't this make it even more... Uh, implausible that the universe could arise without well, God. Well, I think, Dennis, what you're raising here is the question of the fine-tuning of the universe for life. And um, one of the problems with this oscillating model is that in order to get a universe that would oscillate from eternity like this, so that each cycle would be exactly similar to the predecessor, it involves a kind of infinitely precise fine-tuning of initial conditions in order for this to take place. Moreover, this fine-tuning would have to be of a very extraordinary sort because it would be, have to be set at infinity past, which is kind of crazy. How can you have initial conditions be set at past infinity? So the model, even on its face, involves uh, a really, really 
bizarre form of fine tuning in order to have a um, a cyclical behavior like this that would allow um, universes to exist each time that would be uh, characterized by observers like us. Okay. So how popular is that model among cosmologists? Well, according to Stephen Hawking, this was popular back in the 1960s, especially among Russian physicists. But with the um, enunciation of the Hawking-Penrose singularity theorems, it fell into disfavor because what those theorems showed is that any universe collapsing toward a singularity simply ends at that point. There's, there's no way to bounce back. Now, as the one fellow mentioned in recent days, there have been some attempts to resuscitate oscillatory models by figuring ways to avoid collapse down to a singularity, to try to have the universe bounce back before it reaches a singular state. The problem is that those models, even if they succeed in avoiding the singularity, have not been able to be extended into infinity past. You still can't have an infinite past with such models, even if you can avoid collapsing down to a singular point at the end of a cycle. Okay, there was a question right behind you there, I think. Yes. Um, I was going to ask, how, what, what could I point someone to who is questioning whether or not entropy is conserved between cycles? Well, if you look at the article in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, there, it's extensively footnoted with the scientific literature. Um, and so I would recommend looking at that. Um, also, this, uh, this is really a very well-known feature of these models. This isn't some esoteric fact. This has been known for just decades that entropy is conserved. But you could look at the literature that's footnoted there. I may have it in reasonable faith as well. Uh, you look at the footnotes there. All right, any other comment or question on this first point? Just a quick one. When, uh, <clears throat> when you first started talking here, before you drew your chart and started talking about complete oscillation, I envisioned just the pulsing. Just what? Pulsing, like a heartbeat. Uh -huh. Expanding, contracting, but not to the extreme of, of yeah. an end point. Well, that gets into what I was just talking about. The Hawking-Penrose singularity theorem showed that a universe which is under gravitational self-collapse just goes right down to a singularity, like a black hole. It, it just collapses down to a boundary point. Now, by um, exploiting quantum theories of gravity and trying to marry those with general relativity, scientists are trying to show how you could have maybe what you would call a pulsating model where the universe wouldn't collapse all the way down to a singularity, but you could get through to some prior state. But as I say, the difficulty is these models still can't be extended to infinity past. So even if the universe didn't begin with a singular state, um, as in the standard model, the problem of extrapolating it to infinity remains, which is the real issue. The, I, I think that's important to understand. The real issue here is not whether the universe had a beginning in a singular point. The issue is whether the universe began to exist. And whether its beginning was singular uh, as in the point of a cone, where you have a singular point, or whether it's non-singular, as in, say, the Hartle-Hawking model, where it's rounded off at the beginning. In either case, the past is still finite, not infinite. And that's what the second premise of the argument is. Not that the universe began at a singular point, but that the universe began to exist. So don't be misled by folks who say, oh, well, uh, the singularity may not have been real. The singularity is just an artifact of the standard Friedman-Lemaitre model, but we can adopt theories of the universe that avoid the singularity. That's not really the issue. The issue is, did the universe begin to exist? Is the past finite or infinite? Not, was the beginning point or beginning state a singular state or not? And by a singular state, one means a state at which space-time curvature, density, temperature become infinite. That's what one means by that. It would be like this point of a cone. 
All right, any other comment on that first attempt to avoid the beginning? All right, well, let me then uh, talk about another more uh, recent attempt to avoid the beginning of the universe, and that would be by saying that our universe is not, in fact, the entire universe. Our universe is just a pocket universe, which is part of a much wider reality, sometimes called the multiverse. So our universe is just a bubble in a sea of similar bubbles. And each of these is, uh, is expanding, as well as the sea of energy in which these bubbles exist. So our universe has a beginning, but that doesn't mean that the multiverse as a whole has a beginning. The multiverse as a whole can still be eternal and infinite in the past. And the second law of thermodynamics, it would be claimed, only applies to our bubble universe, not to the whole universe, the multiverse as a whole. Well, whether or not the second law of thermodynamics applies to the multiverse as a whole, I think, is a moot point. That's a, a controversial point. If the second law does apply to the whole multiverse, then it implies that the multiverse itself must have a beginning and cannot have existed for infinite time. But in any case, even that aside, we've already seen that the theorem developed by Arvind Bord, uh, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin implies that even the multiverse itself cannot be extended into the infinite past. The bord guth vilenkin theorem that we talked about shows that even the multiverse itself cannot be eternal in the past, but must have a beginning point. So even this foam of bubbles that is forming is something that must have begun to exist, which is again the second premise of the Kalam argument. Any question about the attempt to avert a beginning by appeal to the multiverse? Jonathan. Uh, what if someone were to claim that the multiverse itself as a whole is sort of a, a static entity that never, that's not expanding or contracting, and yeah. that there's just sort of this existent sea of energy that's not subject to space and time because there's kind of... This is of very similar to a kind of model that was developed during the 1970s that I've called vacuum fluctuation models, which says that there is a, a mother vacuum, which is a sort of womb in which these baby universes are formed. And it is a static, eternal entity, this vacuum. And these baby universes are expanding into this great quantum vacuum in which it exists. Well, this model ran into a very serious problem. Namely, at any point in the quantum vacuum, there is a non-zero probability that a universe would form at that point by a quantum fluctuation. So given infinite past time, universes will have come into being at every point in the quantum vacuum. Because given any non-zero probability and enough time, eventually that probability will be actualized. But then those universes will have by now so expanded as to fill the entire quantum vacuum and so will run into each other, coalesce, and form one infinitely large, infinitely old universe, which contradicts observations that we exist in a relatively young universe. So it's not enough to have the bubble universes expanding in this static universe. The, the static universe has to be expanding as well. Well, it's not static. The mother universe has to be expanding as well. And once you do that, then it falls under the bord guth vilenkin theorem, which says any universe, any universe which has on average been in a state of expansion throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a beginning. So the static model was tried, and more recently these multiverse inflationary models have been tried, but what scientists have discovered is, once again, it, they can't be extrapolated to infinity past. Ted. We were away last week, so we didn't get to be here, so obviously we missed some good, important stuff here, but I'm just trying to get caught up here. They are intelligent beings on Earth who think that perhaps these things always were. Is that 
I mean, there's some people who have those theories that well, it just was. There's, there's a good number of people who believe that the universe is eternal in the past and is uncreated and has always existed. But those people struggle with the thought that there could be a deity who always was. And well, all. let's put it this way. Not necessarily, Ted. I'm I just mean, curious. You, you, I, I, Thomas Aquinas, for example, the great medieval theologian, thought the universe could be eternal in the past but still be created by God. It just wouldn't be created at some beginning point. It would just be eternally dependent on God in the way that, say, a heavy weight depending from a chain in the ceiling is always dependent on the chain, even if they had been hanging there from eternity past. So it's not an argument for atheism or against the existence of God, okay. but it would be simply a way of undercutting the Kalam cosmological argument which has a premise in it that says the universe began to exist. If you can undercut that premise, then that would make that argument unsound. I would just, since I didn't, <coughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't understand it. I just, it just amazes me that people would think something could be without having a starting point. I mean, I have this elementary thinking system. You know, it just seems to me like right. if, if something is, if you see an oak tree, one time it was not an oak tree. One time it was an acorn, and before that it was, you know, some. Right. Ran into the well, that tree. gets into those philosophical arguments we talk about whether or not the series of causes can regress infinitely into the past. And I tried to show that that's a very, very difficult notion and very problematic. And what we're finding now is that we have actually not simply philosophical reasons to think the past is finite, but actual scientific reasons as well. Any other comment on this attempt to avoid the beginning? Yes. It seems that many of the people that I talk to that, you know, use this um, are actually trying to avoid the fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, yes. Would I'm not, like, trying to advocate that, you know, there's a genetic fallacy at hand, but should we, like, put extra scrutiny upon people that believe that if their point is that the uh, universe, and that, that's, that's their real origin, their motive? Um, is that it's for fine-tuning and not... Well, I think that your point is well taken in that today there's another argument for the existence of God, the design argument that's based on the fine-tuning of the universe. And the odds against this fine-tuning occurring by chance are so astronomically low. Indeed, that would be an understatement to say they're astronomical. They're, they're so incomprehensibly improbable that the only way to save the chance hypothesis is through the multiverse. It, it, if you can't get the roulette wheel to land on a certain number in one spin, then you posit an infinite number of spins, an infinite number of roulette wheels, and then that way, by chance alone, the improbable will happen. So, if our universe is improbably fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life, the way you get it to happen by chance is you have an infinite number of other universes, most of which are dead and unobserved, yeah. uh, so that this same multiverse hypothesis, you're absolutely right, is the principal means by which the design argument is refuted today. The, the whole debate between practitioners or proponents of design versus uh, skeptics of design is whether or not we live in a multiverse like this and whether or not that will eliminate the fine-tuning. But as I've tried to explain, it has some relevance as well to the Kalam argument in that the proponent of the multiverse could say, yes, our bubble had a beginning, but not the whole thing. Okay. Thanks. Yes. All right. Well, let me go into uh, one final attempt to avoid the implications of the thermodynamic properties of the universe. And this is the speculation that has been floated in some quarters that perhaps our universe is the baby of some prior mother uh, universe which has spawned it. And the idea here is that perhaps uh, black holes are really portals through which energy can tunnel to some other unobservable universe. Uh, and as the energy uh, goes into the black hole, it goes through the wormhole and then is ejected into this other 
uh, space-time region. And the speculation is that with time, the wormhole gets thinner and thinner until finally uh, it pinches off and the baby universe becomes a separate entity in and of itself. And the idea here might be, well, perhaps this process has been going on from eternity past, that our universe is simply the product of some prior universe, which was itself the product of some prior universe, and so on ad infinitum, so that the um, universe which began to exist is merely the product of an infinite series of prior universes, each spawning baby universes through black hole production. Well, could this scenario be extended into the infinite past to avoid the beginning? Well, sorry, uh, it won't work. It's been shown to contradict the laws of subatomic physics or quantum physics. What physicists have discovered is that the information that goes into a black hole remains in our universe. It cannot escape our universe and go to another universe. So that this scenario postulating that this baby universe could pinch off and thereby isolate the information that went into the black hole into another world is uh, physically impossible. This scenario was the subject of a bet between Stephen Hawking and an American physicist named uh, James Preskill. Preskill held that this scenario is impossible, that it contradicts the laws of quantum physics, and Hawking was espousing this. And finally, Hawking, who was one of the last holdouts, admitted in 2004 that he had lost the bet. Uh, offering his apologies to science fiction fans everywhere, Hawking admitted there is no baby universe branching off. The information remains solidly in our, old, uh, in our own universe. So once again, uh, this attempt to avoid the beginning of the universe through very, very speculative uh, cosmological conjectures was shown to be a failure. Any comment or question about this uh, attempt to avoid the beginning? Yes, uh, right here. Okay, Cindy. Given all these failed attempts to explain our universe and its beginning, uh, where do cosmetologists today hold their faith? What model, what idea? Is, are they still searching, or are there some credible model that is being considered as, as maybe... No, it's, it's, it's wide open, Cindy. There are all sorts of competing research programs to try to develop cosmological models of the beginning of the universe. Some of these will involve a, f a beginning in the finite past. Others will be attempts to avoid the, the singular beginning and extrapolate back to a pre-Big Bang condition, for example. But as I say, none of them has succeeded in extrapolating back to infinity past uh, so as to restore the eternal universe and avoid the prediction of the standard model that the universe began to exist. So is the Big Bang the, the current one that has yet to be sort of disproved and the one being taught in school, or where do you know, students... Yeah, I think what, what one would say would be that the, the standard model I is taught as describing accurately the history of the universe right back to very close to the beginning. But then before you get to that point, um, prior to that, remember what we talked about, the Planck time, then they would say, we don't have a physics to describe that early region of the universe. And so we don't really know. We don't have a theory that will allow us to describe what it was like. And, and that is where, as I say, it's just wide open in all sorts of speculations and, and, and different models. But remember, as we shared earlier, the board guth vilenkin theorem applies regardless of your physical description of that era. And the second law of thermodynamics, again, is uh, a scientific theory that is in a field of science that is so well understood that it's almost a closed field of science, so that 
the prospects of avoiding or revising the second law in some way as to avoid the beginning are, I think, are pretty remote. Any other comments or questions on this? Yes, Claire. Let's get the mic here, Claire, so we can hear you. All right, okay. three bubbles in the standard thing where it just keeps getting big. Okay. finally right. runs together, okay? okay? But what were you trying to explain right before that? Because that, that was kind of a, a um, alteration of the first one, and I didn't quite get the three bubbles just by themselves, what you were trying to explain. All right, one. if I understand your question, the second theory that I was talking about was the multiverse model that says our universe is just a bubble in an expanding wider universe and that uh, while our bubble may have begun to exist the whole universe didn't begin to exist that's the second the third one that we've just talked about here no, no, is about based that. upon black hole production of baby universes no I wasn't really talking about that one I was talking about just forget that picture but the picture before that where you had three bubbles up there yes and you said um, if the three bubbles are in a static situation, eventually they would just all grow together. Right, okay, okay yes. I got, I got that, but before you even, I thought that was kind of an addendum to the first idea that you put up there where it's just we had three bubbles, period. And I didn't quite understand what you were trying to get at at that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, it wasn't an addendum. It was a response to Jonathan's question oh. about how we could perhaps adjust the model so that the wider mother universe in which these bubbles are formed is not itself expanding, but it's just static. And I said that ran into the problem that then the bubbles would run into each other and coalesce. Oh, okay. But if you make it expanding so that it expands more rapidly than the bubbles do, so the bubbles can't run into each other, mm -hmm. which is the multiverse model. The, 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 the vacuum is expanding so quickly that it outpaces even the expansion of the bubbles, so they can't coalesce. If you say that, then the bord guth vilenkin theorem applies to the multiverse and you had to have a beginning. All right. So, in conclusion then to this section uh, of the argument, the scientific evidence, I think, of thermodynamics uh, confirms the conclusion that we already reached based on the expansion of the universe that we have good grounds for believing that the universe began to exist. And this evidence is especially powerful because, as I say, the field of thermodynamics is so well understood, a field of science, that it's virtually a closed uh, field. And that makes it highly unlikely that these findings are going to be uh, eventually reversed. So then, on the basis of both philosophical argument and scientific evidence, I think we have good reason for thinking the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument is true, that the universe began to exist. Now, in conjunction with the first premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause, the conclusion therefore follows with logical necessity, therefore the universe has a cause. And what we will now do in our next session is explore the theological implications of their existing a cause of the universe. And I think that we'll see a striking number of divine attributes can be deduced from a conceptual analysis of what it is to be a cause of the universe. So that will be our project next time. The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org.